morning and come. <clears throat> I'll be in fact to talk to you about the history of the area. So I hope you can join us for that. There are three flyers on the uh, table right over here if you're interested, and feel free uh, to contact Devin or myself if you have any questions. Uh, so Devin, right back here, I'm going to point him out, make him stand up and wave, all nice and pretty, uh, is my counterpart, counterpart in this programming series. He is the public history librarian? Yeah? Yes. Okay, that works. Couldn't remember. Uh, but with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Matt Meyer from the Tippecanoe County Public Library. Thank you, Claire. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you. My name is Matt Meyer. I'm a reference librarian at Tippecanoe County Public Library. And tonight I will be uh, leading us off talking about TCPL's history uh, through the years. <laughs> Something might have gotten before I said it. This is what did it. Okay, that should work through house. All right. Thank you. Okay. So TCPL's history dates back to 1882 through multiple library systems. The first Lafayette Public Library, then the Albert A. Wells Memorial Library, and finally, Tippecanoe County Public Library. And with each of those systems, we can divide our history into three distinct phases, with each phase mirroring a certain period of growth in both Lafayette and Tippecanoe County. But before we get to start with Lafayette Public Library, I think it's important to realize that libraries did exist before 1882 in the county. And as part of that, these laid the foundations for modern libraries, and it's worth talking about tonight to sort of get an understanding of the context for which our first libraries were established. So early libraries were established to provide alternatives to vices like gambling and drinking. And with that in mind, very first library that I, at least that I have been able to find was a YMCA library that had about 250 volumes that was established in 1855. In 1860, there was an article in the Lafayette Weekly Argus that mentions a library. Uh, 75 businessmen were getting together to donate money to establish that library. But as is sort of typical of newspapers at the time, there's not a lot of follow-up information on that library. So it might've it might have taken off, I don't know. The next mention is in 1864 in the Lafayette Daily Journal mentioning two libraries, the Township and the McClure. The Township Library was located on Main Street in Murdoch's Grocery Store. The McClure Library was actually located out in Shadeland at the Farmers Institute. These were established by William McClure, who was part of the New Harmony establishment. He had donated money after he died to establish libraries, sort of like what Andrew Carnegie did later on in, in the 19th century. Both libraries were noted as being ill-used and much abused in a letter to the editor at the time. Um, and that letter also called for those two libraries to be unified under one system. Uh, if I recall correctly, that letter to the editor called for an alternative to groggeries. 
which I thought was an awesome word. Um, each of these libraries had about, probably about 300 to 400 volumes each, nothing real fancy. And in fact, with the McClure, most of the books that were in that library had actually been moved up to another floor out of public access to prevent them from being damaged. So not a lot of utility there with that library. And then the next library that we know of was the City Library in 1876. The City Library was located in the Spring and Robertson printing shop on Main Street. Um, an interesting thing about this one was that it required a subscription fee to actually use books in the library. A one, one book checkout was $4 a year, two books at a time was $7 a year, which was a lot of money. Yes, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, this actually is a city library catalog that we have at TCPL. We have two copies of that. I found both of them in the vertical files when I was going through those as part of another project. And I quickly realized how valuable they were and took them down to our basement for further protection. So they're actually not publicly available unless you actually were to ask for them. Uh, but they do date from 1876. And it's just sort of remarkable, really, that we actually have these catalogs, just given how, given all the library systems that they would have gone through. Now, all of these libraries were certainly noble attempts, but they were all small and decentralized, not in a lot of, they weren't in really great locations. I mean, the McClure Library was all the way out in Shadeland, not easy to get out to in those times. So what was needed was a much more centrally located nonprofit library. Which then leads us to the first part of TCPL's history with the Lafayette Public Library from 1882 to 1927. And these two buildings here are the two primary homes of Lafayette Public Library. The first home being the Albert S. White House, which was just over here at 6th and Columbia Street. And then the William F. Reynolds House, which was over on 5th and South Streets. So the first public library in Lafayette is really an embodiment of the progressive era at the time, being that sort of that communal effort towards working towards a common goal, primarily through education. And with that, Indiana passed a law in 1881 allowing for property taxes to be used to fund the development of libraries. In 1882, James Perrin, who is notable for Perrin Neighborhood and was also treasurer of the school board at the time, donated $10,000, which was accrued from the interest generated from that tax money to purchase the Albert S. White home. White was a former senator. I think he had died sometime in the 1860s. So the library opened in the Albert S. White home in 1882 with about 7,000 volumes and was overseen by the school board. However, by 1890, it became apparent that the White House was actually really destined to be used for the first Lafayette High School. So well, once the White House was torn down, the library moved temporarily into the post office. Once the high school was built, the library moved back into the school, occupying two floors on the ground floor. But as the high school expanded, the library became limited, and so it was pushed out yet again, this time moving into the Reynolds House, which was owned by the widow of William F. Reynolds, who I believe was involved with the Monon Railroad. And the library moved there to the Reynolds House in 1901, by that time with 22,000 volumes. And so at this point, it begs the question, why, did, why was there not a Carnegie Library? Carnegie Libraries... We see them all across the state of Indiana, and for good reason, because Indiana had the most Carnegie libraries in the entire country, with 164. 1901 then being sort of a banner year for libraries in general, because that's when the first Carnegie Library was established in Goshen, Indiana. Carnegie, of course, was the owner of U.S. Steel, and he believed that libraries were sort of the people's university and that it was people's duty to educate themselves by using public libraries. So overall, over 1,600 Carnegies were built in the United States between 1901 and 1922, with 164 built here in Indiana alone, being the most of any state, but except for Tippecanoe County, which was one of only nine counties in the, in the entire state that did not have a Carnegie library. And I've not found anything that directly says why there's not a Carnegie, but I can, I think it's safe to assume that because of the efforts that have been made by citizens here in Lafayette, there was sort of that grassroots movement to establish a library on their own instead of going to Carnegie to ask for the money to, to start their own library. And in fact, in a 1904 report to the Indiana State Library, which we have at TCPL, 
uh, librarian Virginia Stein, who was the mother of, of Evelyn Stein, she noted that a patron had noted the splendor of the Reynolds house saying, how pleasant, don't let anyone ask for a Carnegie library. So it became this sort of point of pride that, hey, we don't have a Carnegie library. Look at us. We established our own system on our own. But even though, even though there was a noble effort to establish a library on our own without Carnegie's help, there were still limitations to the Lafayette Public Library. Notably, collections were small and not browsable. The catalogs that I brought over there from the library, those would have been used to search for items and then staff would have gone to pick those items up for patrons. Very similar to what we did at TCPL last year, if anyone went there during renovations and we happened to do that for you, which was a wonderful experience for all. <laughs> <laughs> so also the library was continually faced with having to move because collections were kept growing, but the buildings were just not suitable for being in a library. Or in one case, a high school was built and they needed more room. So what was ultimately needed was a centrally located facility that was actually built to be a library this time to serve the needs of the city and that could evolve with expanding demand. And then we enter in the Albert A. Wells Memorial Library from 1927 to 1989. So besides being a dapper looking gentleman, if I may say so, <laughs> Albert Wells was a local pharmacist famous for the Wells Yeager Best Pharmacy, which he founded in the 1890s. Wells was born in 1848 in Laramie Township, so southern Tippecanoe County. Um, at 15 years old, he volunteered to fight in the Civil War. And then once he returned back to Lafayette after the war, he then began um, training to be a doctor. He trained under Moses Baker, who formed the first C-section in the state of Indiana. Started Wells Yeager Best in, in the 1890s. By 1917, he had retired, and he and his wife, Ellen, moved first to Asheville, North Carolina, then Orlando, and then Indianapolis. And while, it was in, while they were in Orlando, Albert expressed a desire to do something for the people of Lafayette, just based on the experiences that he had had while living there. Initially, he did not favor building a library. What he really wanted was either a children's home or an old folks home, but Ellen convinced him otherwise because she reasoned that a library could be municip municipally supported. And so with that, in 1926, he and Ellen donated $120,000 for land and construction of the building over at North and 7th Streets. So... There's a lot of features to Wells Library. I mean, when you look at the front, you know, you see these elegant columns. You've got the inscriptions across the top here and above the front entrance. Albert stipulated that there must always be a children's department in the library, and he also required that the library had to bear his name. He and Ellen worked with Walter Scholler, who we all know who that was, to work on the building. Ellen mostly worked on the decorations on the interior, but also came up with the inscription that's right up here across the front of the entrance, uh, this library is dedicated to all lovers of books. So Wells Library opened in 1927 in a 14,000 square feet facility with about 46,000 volumes and a capacity for 62,000 volumes. So finally, we have this building that we can actually expand into something that we can really, really get used to working in. Albert was in failing health, but he was able to attend the opening but unfortunately he passed away about a month later in, in 1927. <laughs> and so with Wells, Wells became that centrally located facility that served the entire city. By 1936, there were 57,000 volumes. By 1969, there were 90,000 volumes. So it quickly, quickly <laughs> outgrew its capacity. In 1959, the library opened a branch at Tecumseh Middle School. And up until about, Three or four weeks ago, I didn't even know this branch existed. Actually, this is something totally new to me. I was always under the assumption that Wells was just a one branch library, never had any branches in the city. But going through some archives that we just came that we have at the library, I realized that we had this branch from about 1959 to 1961. And it was a short lived branch because it was housed in Tecumseh Middle School, which had just been built at the time. And it was sort of confusing the way that the arrangement was set up. Tecumseh took care of the space, the library took care of the collections, but there was a separate Tecumseh collection and a separate Wells collection. So there was just a lot of separation there. 
it was not in a good location and it had different hours based on the school year. So during the when school was in session, it closed earlier. When school was not in session during the summer, it closed later. So it just wasn't wasn't optimal. And in fact, in our archives at the library, we have a letter from the IU School of Library Science to Thelma Wooten, who was longtime librarian at Wells. And basically what the letter was saying was it was giving her advice on who to talk to to voice her opposition to the Tecumseh branch because she was very against this branch. And eventually the branch closed in 1961 after being open for about 18 months because it just was not in a good location and a more permanent location was needed to serve that side of the city. In 1963, the school board reorganized, which then meant that the library was finally divested from the school board, which I think kind of plays into when they had the branch Tecumseh because the school board made that decision over the librarians, and that's why the librarians were so against that branch. In 1968, the library finally got its first bookmobile using uh, funds from the Library Services Act. This, this bookmobile, as you can see, did not just serve Tippecanoe County, but it also served Montgomery County. They both worked together with the bookmobile at the time. Funds ran out in 1970, and at the time there was debate on whether the bookmobile should be continued. And at the time, Montgomery County said, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna continue with this. And what ultimately happened was that the contractual library was established using the bookmobile to serve residents outside of the city limits living in the county. By this point though, especially by the early 80s, Wells was becoming just way too small. And as part of that, Tippecanoe County Public Library was formed from a merger of the Wells Library Board and the Contractual Library Board. Because they were two separate boards, they were drawing a very small amount of tax money to provide services. And by combining the two boards and having a larger tax district, they could then adequately serve everyone living in the county. Which then leads us to Tippecanoe County Public Library. So right away, once the, once TCPL was formed, it became apparent that the library had to move out of Wells. There were over 100,000 items in the building by this time. Remember, it had only been built to hold 46,000 or 60,000 volumes. So it was very crowded. And going through pictures, I don't know how anyone could have functioned in that library in the 80s because the, just the amount of books in there was just insanity. But there were problems to trying to pick a new location or what to do. Purchasing adjacent land around the building was infeasible due to the cost and building branches was not feasible because there were not enough staff and resources at the time to man those branches. So moving became the only option. And so then a site, the current site, South, South and 7th Streets was chosen. And then the fun began, <laughs> to put it mildly. I could have easily done an entire program just on this, honestly. <laughs> building the downtown library was no picnic. Not a picnic at all, a lot of vans, just a lot of inclement weather. First plan was a 56,000 two-story building that was defeated in public referendum. So we went to a second referendum with a reduced size building. I think this time it was around 50,000 square feet and it was defeated yet again. Now it's interesting when you think about this because the downtown library was really the first library built using taxpayer money. All previous libraries had been donated in some shape or form, whether it was the, the houses, whether it was Wells Library, or even the high school. Like it had always been in an existing structure of some kind. And so that debate ultimately centered around how much taxpayer money should be used to fund this project. And when you go through newspaper clippings from the 80s, there was a lot of debate on this, to say the least. Some people said, why should we have a new library when we already have Wells Library? Some said, why should we have a new library when we have Purdue or West Lafayette? We have all these other libraries. Why can't we just combine them all into one? Ultimately, a compromise was reached in 1988 where half would be paid by a bond and half out of the operating budget. So we're in the clear, right? No, we are not in the clear at all, actually, because there was further controversy over the demolition of historic homes that were on the site of the library. There were eight Victorian cottages on the site built between, I think, the 1840s and the 1860s. And the, there were very, there was a controversy over demolishing them. And ultimately, one of those houses was able to be moved, but none of the others were. So finally, construction starts in 1988, 48,000 square feet. Library opens following year in 89 with 140,000 volumes. Just you know, think about that in Wells Library at the time. 
Now, even though the library did move to the downtown building, it still stayed in Wells for bookmobile operations and it remained there until 1993. By that time, the library sold Wells to the Tippecanoe Arts Federation, now known as the Arts Federation, where it still stands today. So the downtown library, similar to Wells Library, was, was a chance to bring in all these different features. First off, we have the copper roof, as I'm sure you've all noticed. We have native landscaping around the building. The Sweezy Room of Indiana History, which is my personal favorite spot in the entire building, uh, donated by banker Burr S. Sweezy. He donated money for some HVAC, but also to help establish this collection. And then also in the Indiana Room, there's a stained glass window called the River of Knowledge donated by Mary Sixby. Uh, I believe she lives in Battleground. And it was inspired by the Wabash River flowing through. You can, it's, you, it's better when you actually look at it in person. And then also, if anyone's been in our youth department, you've noticed those weird floaty thingies in the ceiling, right? That was a kinetic sculpture created by Dan Engelke, who is a professor over Purdue. Um, it, <laughs> it's confusing because it's like you, you look at them and you're like, what are these things, right? And the best description is that you look at them and it's supposed to invoke feelings of looking at clouds, you know, like kind of that imagination where you're like, oh, well, that looks like such and such. So that's what it's supposed to evoke is like, it's not really supposed to be like a specific thing. They're just supposed to be more of evoking these certain feelings. And yes, those sculpt the sculpture, it's in good hands during renovation right now. It's all tucked away, no problems there. So since 1989, when the building opened, there have been quite a few achievements as the library has been able to expand now that it has this, its own building to really, to really expand in. 1994, TipCat was introduced. No more where we're using these uh, catalogs over here. We finally had our own computerized system. Free internet access was first offered in 96. One million items check out in 97. The library again started br doing branches uh, with the joint Ivy Tech TCPL branch from 2002 to 2016. Along with those, three more branches opened at Klondike, Wyandotte, and Wea, and the Ivy Tech branch closed due to a shift in approach to the branches. And as I'm sure you've all noticed over the last year, we've been slicing into the building for renovations, long awaited renovations. Um, renovations started in February of last year, right? Yeah. So renovations started, we have new carpeting, new paints, new lights, you know, it's new entrances as seen here at the South Street side. So finally, you know, we're gonna be open again at the end of July with renovation if everything's on track, right? <laughs> and and so then we'll finally be, everyone be able to come in and be able to enjoy the library again without the hindrance of construction workers and that is my presentation <laughs> and now I will bring up Brooke from Otterbun It. Okay. Huh. Well, um, as with the history of any um, town or town library or things of that nature, there'll be a lot to cover. So I'm going to do my very best to pack as much as I can to the next 20 minutes. Um, and my name is Brooke Sauter. I actually serve two different roles um, in this room tonight. I'm employed by the Tippecanoe County Historical Association, actually, and I'm uh, the feast lady. So um, if you come to this year's Feast of the Hunter's Moon, I'll probably You'll probably see me. I'll probably see you as I'm running past it at light speed. Um, but I am also honored to be a um, substitute library clerk at the Audubon Public Library when they desperately need someone to keep the library open. That's me. Um, and I, sorry, we have someone trying to join the Zoom. Um, and I am very proud to be a part of such a cool library in the town of Otterburn. Um, This kind of came to be because in 2020, 
We kicked off a project focusing on Otterburn's sesquicentennial or 150th anniversary. And so I came on as a project manager for what we came to call the Otterburn 150 project because sesquicentennial was just too much to say. Um, and so a lot of these pictures and experiences came from some of our research that was done during that project. Um, but I have effectively hung around um, the library as well as the town of Otterburn and have stepped into the pseudo historian role um, after all of the wonderful research and connections that were made through the Otterman 150 project, which really did span um, about a year's time because we kicked it off right at the beginning of um, 2023. Um, and the exhibit that we put on that you'll see some photos of later didn't open until August and finally closed that December. So it was a year of celebrating all of Otterman's history. And really, um, the library can really be seen as the center of much of it. It's been um, then, as it was now, a very important meeting space within a community. Otterburn currently boasts 937 residents, and we are not at our highest uh, population, but it hasn't been too much higher than that at various points. Um, and the library is still a very popular place for our residents to make use of resources as well as use as a public meeting space. We're very fortunate that the American Legion has their monthly meetings there, as well as a lot of other groups. Um, so it really is a great place to spend time. And so on that note, we will get started. Um, but this story really does um, begin with a little bit of background about Otterbin and, and where it got that funky name. So many people um, call it Otterbean, or it, but it's, it's Otterbin. Um, and actually, we have a wonderful mural on our library wall that says it's a library you otter be in. <laughs> um, and our... Uh, mascot is Opal the Otter, so we really lean heavily into that. But my friend here is actually William Otterbin Brown. He is the town's namesake, and this was his home um, as it stood in 1854. And his home actually still stands on the main drag in the town of Otterbin um, and is currently inhabited by a family that really values that history. Um, and I've heard occasionally, if you ask real nicely, they'll let you come inside, and they've still got some wood that has never been affected during any restorations that they can point out and be like, oh, that's, that's original to the house. Um, so I'm told I haven't experienced it yet. But um, William Otterbin Brown really was a very important person within um, Otterbin's history, so much so that they named the town after him while he was still living. Um, so Otterbin was actually originally um, a plot of land that they called Pond Grove. It's very marshy out there. And we actually at one point had a cranberry bog that was a, a very large part of the economic uh, sphere of Otterbin. Um, during the semi-recent past, but it was originally known as Pond Grove and was mostly open farmland on the eastern border of Benton County. Now, you may be saying, so why are you here? Um, and it's because the town of Otterburn, funny enough, actually straddles Benton and Tippecanoe County, and we have a reciprocal agreement with uh, folks who live in Tippecanoe County as well as um, a little bit of Warren County in the um, Green Hill area, as well as all the Otterburnites, as they call themselves. Um, because there is not a library in Shelby Township where Montmorency sits. And so we welcome all of our Montmorency friends here into the Otterburn area and we just rope them in. Um, but so the first 60 plots of land were laid out by John Levering and his wife on October 25th, 1872. And so that was what made um, 2022 our 150th anniversary. But then there were another edition of plots laid out in 1883. But Otterburn traces its original founding history to 1872. But as you can see, um, William Otterburn Brown had lived here um, since the 1850s. And so he was one of our original founders. Um, William Otterburn Brown, though, was actually a farmer and a stock dealer, um, and at one point he held the office of the postmaster from 1872 when Otterburn was officially formed until his death four years later in February of 1879. Um, there's been some lore about our, our good friend Otterburn Brown. This was a town as it was laid out in 1878, but um, in 1972 there were a lot of articles um, if there's one thing that I learned through my research was that there was a big party in 1872. They really knew how to get down. And one of the things that um, they talked about frequently was, you know, the importance of William Otterbin Brown. While it was truly documented and we have some research showing his time as postmaster, it was also rumored that he held some of the original school classes in his home and that he supposedly had a small um, sharing library, but it's, that's kind of murky. It's one of those rumors where you think it it might be nice that it was true, but I hadn't found anything that backs it up significantly that makes me believe it was anything more than some pleasant thoughts. But anyway, so some of this um, 
research here that was shared in the Benton Review, a paper that is still in print to this day, um, did some research on Otterbin and his namesake um, town. But the first, the Otterbin Street Fair, this is a bit more uh, research and a background about the town of Otterbin itself. Um, one thing that the town of Otterbin still does to this day is holds a street fair, and we actually had a cute little um, bunch of carnival rides and things of that nature as a way to bring the community together. There were bands and all kinds of things in the year of um, 2022 when they had the sesquicentennial. But um, they've been doing this since 1899. And there were a couple of years where it fell out of favor or they couldn't gather enough volunteers to actually make the event happen. But it's something that they have done to celebrate ever since. And one thing I have always found to be so interesting is that the town of Otterburn really does have a great sense of community. It is certainly um, somewhat of a sleeper town. We have a lot of people who live in and around Otterburn who might work at Purdue, work at some of the factories here in town. Um, but one thing that is so interesting is there really are a lot of people who are proud to be a part of the Otterman community. And you really see that at the library, but also at things like the street festival. So here's our first official library. Um, this was the, um, there was a reading room actually established in January of 1898 um, that was located in the West end of Otterman. And then in, this was that the building. They had actually at one point put, you might be able to see public library on the window, but it was really not much more than a reading room where some people think of it as like one of the, the little free libraries you see today on steroids. There were a lot of um, items that you could use and enjoy, but it wasn't necessarily the library that you would imagine um, today. But so in the spring of 1919, a meeting was called at the town hall and plans were actually formulated to make a, a real library as they wanted it to be. Um, shortly after that, leaders were then sent out um, to secure the necessary signatures for which a board of trustees of the town of Otterburn and the tra trustees of Bolivar Township granted the necessary tax levy in order to actually make that want and dream a reality. Um, I believe, yes. Yeah, so the very first library board meeting was held June 16th of 1919. And this is where um, a lot of the people of town consider this to be the first full-fledged library was when it was established in 1919. Um, so these were some notes which are, are interesting, but what's so cool in my personal opinion is they had the forethought to take a picture. And so um, Harry Kretschmann there on the end was actually a state representative um, during the same time in which he served on the board of trustees. And there's a lot of paperwork and material about Harry Kretschmann in um, the Otterman history books. I might be a little bit biased because he's like one of those distant, distant sort of kind of maybe relatives in my husband's long family tree. So I ran into that when I was doing some personal research. Um, but a lot of these names as well, um, like Harrington, Bolt, and Holder are names that you still see in Otterman's history even today. Um, in fact, my neighbor is a descendant of Carolyn Holder and her relatives are, are still in the area. Um, but so this was the original Board of Trustees for the Otterburn um, Public Library. And so D.E. Harrington that you'll see, Daniel, on the end, he was the board president um, for their first go around. So temporary quarters were found, a librarian was secured, and a book shower was held, which brought in 500 books. <laughs> Um, a permanent site downtown became available for 3,500 bucks and Mr. R.H. Bolt became interested and solicited just $1,510 in subscriptions from interested citizens. Um, the library board borrowed the remainder, sold this dwelling, the 1910 dwelling, um, and a black shop that blacksmith shop that was on that lot to buy a smaller building um, and then moved into the new location, which... Um, this was the best exterior photo, though not much really changed between 1919 and its building and this photo of it in the 1970s. Um, so this building was actually constructed in 1934 and it stood 24 by 32 feet with a basement and it was built as part of a public works project. Um, the money for the materials had been accumulated by the library board over a 15 year period and labor costs were paid by the federal government as part of an effort to encourage economic recovery. In 1963, two rooms were added by the Otterburn American Legion here on the back end. And that is part of why I find it so interesting that the Legion still holds their meetings in the library system to this day. And I will say I may be a little bit biased, but our American Legion group is a very wonderful group of men. 
Um, at one point, there was actually a branch of the Otterburn Public Library located in the town of Templeton, which is in western Bolivar Township, which is about five miles um, west of Otterburn itself. Um, and that branch was managed by Nora Sheets, Josephine Gick, and Nell and Ezra Coates from 1919 until it closed in 1967. Um, so not much really changed between the iteration and the construction of this building plus the two additions in 1963. And then the next big point in Otterburn's history was their centennial in 1972. Um, this is just a small clipping of all of the pictures I found. Um, from the centennial celebration that was held over the course of four days. Um, they went so far as to actually have a photo um, booth with a backdrop set up. And of course, none of those made it into this picture that I would be talking about. Um, and I mean, there are, are chunks and chunks and chunks of photos from this um, celebration. What was very interesting is a lot of the folks who were uh, younger during the 1972 celebration and were active in the 2022 celebration, um, we're finding pictures of themselves in these pictures and going, oh, this is and my mother, and my mom, and all that wonderful stuff. And so it was um, very neat. Um, but 1972 was a big year for the town of Otterman. Um, this was again, that same building from another angle. So there it was in the seventies, here it was in 1999. Um, and that building actually remained the Otterman Public Library until 2004. Um, when the library board received a bond issue to tear it down and build a whole new facility. So first we had a reading room, and then we had that building at the end of town, and then we had this one. And then in 2004, um, they cut the ribbon and they opened a brand new Otterburn Public Library that was significantly larger um, than the uh, 19, uh, 19 building. And so this was the Otterburn Public Library in 2021, which you may notice I wrote, pre-edition. Um, so when the new facility opened, it had 11,502 square feet and held over 20,000 items in its location. So the 1934 building was 24 by 32 feet and the 2004 building opened with over 11,500 feet of um, usable space for the public. So it's located on the corner of Main and First Streets on the spot where that farmer library actually stood. Um, and so during that time, the library had kind of moved around and their collection was essentially housed up um, and was very limited access until they had the new building established. Um, so the library's growth is better reflected in the fact that we have 410 borrowers in 1910 that had access to over just over 1,040 items, while in 1971, we had 1,092 borrowers with almost 7,500 items available. And then as of 2012, the library had 1,700 borrowers and 21,566 items available to the community. So they've been on nice, steady growth. Um, they're currently going through a weeding process. So I decided I shouldn't ask um, how many items are in the collection because I have a feeling I would have been met with some unhappy faces. Um, but so in 2021, things really got interesting because they decided that they were going to work on building a new addition. So we're back in time here, mid 1990s. There's the original building before it was torn down. And then there was this um, dome shaped building that was um, Nick's Auto Shop right next door. Um, and there it is again, when it was in its prime, AIDS Philip 66, 66 service. Isn't that cool and some of the neat old retro cars. Um, and so this was the building in 21, I believe, 20 or 21. And you can see just in the background, it's, it wasn't in, in too hot of shape. And it had actually sat vacant for um, a couple of years prior to this transaction that had taken place. Um, we had some very kind donors, uh, Roy and Sherry Bryant pictured here with our former library director, Letitia Provo. Um, and the Bryants here actually sold Nick's Auto Shop to the library for $1 because they wanted to see this happen. Um, that badly. Um, there was actually a lot of opposition from the town. We had a lot of historic preservationists in the area who didn't want to see this building torn down and replaced with an addition onto the library. And I'm a little torn because I'm a lover of abandoned, crugly, funky buildings. But yet I also really love all that the library allows for a community to enjoy and grow with. Um, the one thing that a lot of the community really did not take into consideration was the state of that building and the fact that it had been unoccupied for many years. And so they did go ahead and uh, tear it down with the idea of drawing on an expansion into the building where that um, auto shop previously sat. So these were the sketches done by Gordon Clark, 
here in town. And moving forward, there's Sherry. Um, she actually is kind of excited. She looks a little terrified, but I promise she's excited. Um, as they started demolition on the building. And then in 2021, work began. And so they are starting to secure a lot of the existing building in order to prepare for the demolition work that would be the addition. Um, and so here it is midway through. Um, this dark blue material was all new and this much taller second story was the original. So where that kind of, where that wall ends and the blue begins was all of the new material added to the Auburn Public Library. And you can see it's, it is right here on our main drag, right in the center and the heart of Otterburn. Um, So when we were working on the Otterburn 150 project, I spent a lot of time with Roy and Sherry. And I felt that the story really couldn't be told without them, um, in part because they were so gracious in donating the building and land space to the library, but also because of the wealth of knowledge um, that Roy specifically and Sherry both are. Roy and Sherry are both natives to the area, and Roy spent has spent, I swear, his entire life, I can just imagine him at two or three years old walking around talking about the importance of the history of Otterbin. Um, at least he really leads me to believe that because he was just such a wealth of knowledge. And so they had me over to their home, um, as you can see, and he pulled out all these different neat artifacts to share with me during the Otterman Sesquicentennial project. And during that time, we spent so much, so many hours around the kitchen table on multiple occasions talking about the history of Otterburn, their personal experiences, a lot of stories they had to share about people who may no longer have been with us but played a very pivotal role in the story of Otterburn, um, as well as things that they would like to then donate to be a part of the addition. We actually have a room named after them, the Bryant Room in the addition, um, to recognize all of the hard work and dedication that they put toward this project. Um, Roy is not in the best of health and he was not able to make our grand opening. Um, he is still with us, so he is on hospice care. Um, but his wife, Sherry, is a very frequent visitor of the Otterburn Public Library. Um, and so this is just a small snippet of the timeline of Otterburn's history, and we won't go through all of it. Um, but this was just a small touch of all that came to be the Otterburn 150 project. And what is so cool is that from the town's very humble beginnings, the library has played a very central role through all of its eras. Um, maybe it had different shapes or was in different parts of downtown, but the library has always served that pivotal role of being a community gathering space, as well as now it is really the keeper of our history. Um, and we had um, in 2022, we had 250 items loaned or donated by 75 different donors, including the Typical New County Historical Association um, that made this project a reality. And um, many of those items, I'm thrilled to say, were actually donated to the library's uh, permanent collection. Benton County does have a historical society based out of Fowler, and they were incredibly uh, pivotal in that project's history as well. Um, but the library has kind of become the, the keeper of, of Otterburn's history. And I find that to be wonderful, um, if only for the logistical reasons of the historical society is open on Wednesdays during the day, um, but you can really access a lot of the Otterburn archives at any point, which the library is open, which is six days of the week. So this week were some exhibits from the Otterburn 150 project and some of the items that were donated and loaned. Um, but then in 2023, the addition was completed and here we are having our celebration and there is my friend Sherry and our uh, past uh, director, Letitia, showcasing the um, tree that was planted in honor of Roy and Sherry. So, but that is the exterior of our beautiful building. And then um, today, as a little bit of a wrap, the library boasts many different books and as well as other resources such as magazines, movies. We also have uh, virtual video games that, um, the kids can either rent and take home like they would any other um, catalog item at the library, or we also have the facilities for the kids to be there and play the games while they are here at the library, which we have found to be very well used, but also a nice place for the kids to go and gather while doing so in a safe and communal space, um, as well as other things of that nature. Um, I did invite our brand new director, Patrick, Patrick McMillan, to join us tonight, but um, he started Monday, so he's got a lot of other stuff on his plate. Um, 
so I'll be sharing these slides with him so he can brush up on his Otterburn history. Mm -hmm. But um, I did have the opportunity to meet him yesterday, and he talked with me about some of his grand plans for Otterburn Public Library's future, um, and it is very bright. While um, Letitia Provo did just leave us um, a couple of months ago, she went on to be the county's economic development director, so you can't be too mad at her. Um, but I have had some great talks and about the impact that Otterburn made on her and how it really helped her in this new role by meeting all the different neat community members um, in this community and beyond. But yeah, the future is very bright for Otterburn, if for no other reason that we have a very beautiful newly expanded building and um, man, more resources pouring in every day to fill it with. But um, that's what I have on the history of Otterburn and the Otterburn Public Library. Thank you. I'll hand it off to Nick. Very nice, thank you. Well, it's a real cluster of audiovisual stuff here that you may not be able to see, but wow, lots of stuff. Um, a shout out to, where's Claire? Oh, good. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, shout out to Claire and to Jeff for um, being being here tonight to provide this program. Um, I'm on the TCHA board of directors now, so it's great to it's great to share this um, this experience with everybody here. And I want to mention, um, I can't, I'm short enough, I cannot, so I, <laughs> I will move around. Um, I want to. I want to say I remember the. I, as many people here, I remember the Wells Building, and I remember Ralph Van Handel with his cigars in the basement, and I remember there's so much lore in that space, and I certainly remember the old Otterburn Public Library because I used to go to visit uh, uh, Becky Jewett there when she was library director, and she was she was a class act. Um, and she, you had a big school collection, or at least she was very proud of having the high school and stuff collection in the library. She, that was really cool. Don't even get me started on all of the, the library <laughs> collections, parts of the school stuff. That was cool. Yeah, she was, she, that, was, that was really a big thing for her. Um, and, and, and rightfully so, because um, as, as our, as my um, predecessors here have said, um, public libraries, especially in Indiana, are really, um, cornerstones of their communities, whether it's whether it's a big city um, like Lafayette or like Kokomo um, or or Fort Wayne, for that matter, um, libraries are really a key part of of most every community um, in our in our state, and in Indiana especially, um, libraries are great places for talking and for communicating with each other. Library directors love to talk with each other. And I have been to Otterbin, I've been to Fowler, I've been to many times to TCPL, over to Kokomo. It's just, it's a wonderful experience that I can look back on. Um, I wanna thank um, in particular, a couple of people for what I'm going to present to you tonight. Um, Carol Abel, um, who wrote uh, a, a, a wonderful history of the, of the West Lafayette Public Library several years ago um, to Devin, for providing us with all that. I know he's here, yeah, there he is. Um, to Devin for gathering all this stuff together. Um, you'll see in the slide when we get there, um, uh, the slide that I have on the um, archives is before you actually took stuff and moved it into proper condition. Um, it's much better. And to Jean Sullivan for um, allowing me to um, use her expertise for going through so much of the library's history. We celebrated a um, hundred years ago, not that long ago, and Jean was critical in getting a lot of the information from the Friends scrapbooks. And I, um, Devin let me bring two of the Friends scrapbooks over there, um, including when we were luring children, in, no, teenagers, right? We were luring teenagers in into the West Lafayette Public Library. You'll wanna, you'll wanna check that one. We can, I cannot imagine, that was in the Journal and Courier. I cannot imagine the journal and courier um, doing that today. Well, and I also had the opportunity to go through the uh, board minutes for many, many years. And if you want some, ex if you're a librarian or a library lover, um, read the board minutes. They are just, they're both hysterical and also leave you with more questions. What, what my little one, I know I tend to talk. My one favorite moment my one favorite moment in the board minutes is before any of the board members who are here tonight were here before, um, before even before David Hubdy. Um, the 
in in 1945 something big happened in the world world war ii ended and i think i've shared this with jane with, with jane with jean before and the board minutes i thought oh well surely they're going to make a big deal out of the end of the war for heaven's sake because they never notice anything they they notice they're very West Lafayette Public Library centric, and they really don't notice the larger world. So I thought, well, surely that's going to produce something. Well, it did. There's a line in the 1945 summer board minutes saying, we adjourned to Mrs. McQueen's um, home for tea and cookies. That was it. And I thought, well, that must be because of the end of the war, because there was nothing else in the minutes that led me to believe that anything special was happening. So it it's weird stuff. Anyway, so if you're taking minutes for any organization, um, occasionally it'd be nice to pepper them with something going on in the in the larger world. Do I use this or do I use the? That Actually, that's the TV. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Well, so West Lafayette Public Library. There we are. Excellent. It worked. It worked. Yes. Um, I don't know why, and I and I thank Matt for um, and 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 Brooke both for mentioning Andrew Carnegie because um, he was Saint Andrew to many librarians, and I know he has a very checkered. Talk about Moses Fowler. Um, he had a very checkered background, but librarians tend to really like him because, as was pointed out, he built a lot of libraries around the around the world. For some reason. West Lafayette also did not choose to become a Carnegie Library. Um, and I still don't know why, and there's nobody around who can tell me now. Um, so unless someone has a, a strange little quirky history. Um, but by the 1920s, World War II has just ended. We're beginning to go into the roaring 20s. And what happens in West Lafayette? A lot is happening in West Lafayette. Um, WBAA begins broadcasting from the campus of Purdue University. The Purdue Women's Club is started. And there's some interesting history on that if you want to read some interesting history about an organization. The new fire station um, is built in West Lafayette and the police join them soon enough. And I also have a couple of other places, the, uh, the Jewel Box Bank, the Louis Sullivan Building um, at the top of State Street is built. Um, the, um, the local watering holes begin to um, begin to pop up around the Purdue campus. Um, the, the Varsity Apartment Building is built. Must have been wonderful, but uh, what well, was wonderful when I came in 81. And Triple X um, became a big thing. And, and the, the one other building there is uh, uh, the Miller Building also um, was being developed. Here we are. I too have the first library board minutes. Um, and I, I I brought this copy because you can see the handwriting. They did not, they were not nice and typing. At, they didn't type it up. They didn't have a typewriter yet. We'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> and I do have a, thank goodness, a grad student came in um, maybe 10 years ago and typed up all the early um, board minutes, which is wonderful because try to read that and make sense out of it. But that was, um, those were the first board members on the uh, library board. It, it sounds very much like um, our other library board um, folks who have spoken before. The West Lafayette Library, though, started not as a Carnegie Library, but as a special project of the newly formed League of Women Voters. The League of Women Voters had just started the year before. They were looking around for a project, evidently, and they said, hmm, perhaps West Lafayette could use a library. And so they took it on as their big project for 1921. And lo and behold, along with... Uh, Along with the League of Women Voters, um, the city of West Lafayette was beginning to, to develop some, um, some civic centers. This is do, this building, of course, is still standing. This is the where the eclectic hair salon is right now, um, just a couple of blocks down, or just actually one block down from the, from the current library building. These um, gentlemen, and they're all gentlemen, um, were the city leaders um, at the time in the... Uh, in the in the city of West Lafayette, this fellow, Mr. Vauter, um, comes up over and over and over again in the uh, public library minutes. He was on the library board 
And we even know who this young fellow is, the young dapper fellow. Um, I, someday I'd love to find out what happened to him later in life because he certainly looks, uh, he's got attitude okay. in that photo. And well, he should, because he's sitting, he's sta they're standing outside that poor gnarled tree, um, the, uh, the West Lafayette uh, fire station. And this, of course, is where the, the doors were. Anyway, so the newly formed library board composed of local businessmen, attorneys, the dean of women for Purdue University, and other leading members of town life, set up a what? A subscription library. Um, and they, the board members, whether you're on the library board or you're on the other board, they, they squabble about people not paying their, their subscriptions at every single library board meeting. There's a list of who paid, how much they paid, and who still owes money. It's, it's just like, okay, um, I'll, I'll point out, I'll give a shout out to the Shook family because they were early subscribers. They paid early on. They paid their full subscription fee. So um, good for the Shooks. And some other people did too. I, but it, it's like reading these board minutes, you go, wow, you have, and, and indeed they didn't get a tax levy um, until a couple of years into the library. So I can, I can understand where that was important to them. At the same time, they set out to, uh, to uh, find the first librarian for West Lafayette. And we're gonna to get to Eva Dickey here in just a moment. Um, this is a plaque that is on the 115 North John C. Street that the city put up, um, which is, and you can go over and read it today if you want to, if you, even if you don't wanna get your hair done. Um, it's, it's a very nice um, recognition of that building that, that started in 1898 and what has happened to it since that time. Um, there's the original building now um, in, when it, was, uh, when it was a fire station and uh, the firemen lived up on the top or uh, hung out on the top floor, they probably lived there. And the downstairs um, was of course where the, uh, where the horses were kept along with the fire wagon. Lucille Washburn, who we'll get to in just a moment, um, when she said when she came, the, the library was still in this building when she came in the middle of 50s, and she said she could tell that there had been horses in that building. Some of you will understand where, where that's going, um, because she said on really hot days, you could tell that horses had been stabled in this very building. I don't think she was too disappointed when they moved, at least, at least in the suburbs. So Eva Dickey, our first director of the West Lafayette Public Library, 1922 to 1941, um, we see her here um, reading. She was an, an indomitable woman. She took on the task of forming the first public library along with her library board. Um, some fascinating anecdotes as you read through the early history. Um, she was responsible um, for shoveling the coal into the, uh, into the furnace um, because that's how they heated the building, right? Um, and she would close down from 12 to 1 so that she could have lunch, which I thought was really nice of the board um, to allow her to do that she, because she worked alone. She did not have an assistant until quite far into her tenure. And then they agreed to give her um, help on Saturdays and on the occasional evening. So um, basically, it was Eva. Um, if you walked in, it was Brooke, right? Um, and she got to know the community um, seriously well. She was um, she was a local woman, and they sent her to the Indiana State Library for a summer library degree. Um, back then, you could get a degree over the summer at the State Library, which must have been really nice. Um, and she spent all those many years um, working with the community. By not. By 1924, remember the, the library starts 1921, or at least the idea of the library starts in 1921. 1922, 1923, um, we're building up to, we actually open a building, uh, the top floor. I think I wanna go back now. The top floor um, was the original public library and there were stairs over, over here. Does anyone remember using, okay. I, I know because I, I remember people telling me that the, the kids' room eventually moved upstairs. And so people remember going upstairs um, to visit the kids' room. Anyway, um, Mrs. Dickey um, took over and, and was running the library. Um, the library's first decade, she 
you've got an incredible amount of, of work done. Uh, West Lafayette also had something of a, uh, of a series of book showers where people would bring in their books and she would catalog them. Um, there are, there's a, a discussion in the board minutes about getting the first phone for the library. So I guess before that, you just what dropped by and said, hey, I'd like to check something out. Um, in 1924, they actually purchased the building from the city um, and the city gave them a reasonable deal. They didn't charge a dollar, but they did. They did get a good deal, I think, on the building um, because the city had moved into um, fire station number one. They had moved not only the fire department, but uh, the police and the, and the city, what few city um, people were available into there. Later in 1924, the library decides to go with the Dewey Decimal System. Yes. And what did that mean? It meant the board spends time in their minutes talking about the need for a typewriter. So what do they do? This is so wonderfully bureaucratic. They appoint a committee to decide what's the best typewriter we can get. And Mrs. Dickey is part of the, is part of the committee. Um, and they come back in a couple of months and they, they actually come up with a typewriter, um, which they purchase. And I guess, I don't think it's the typewriter that's currently in the library, which is too bad. I don't know what happened to it. Um, it I don't think it was there when I came in 81. They also uh, slid in a slide projector for children's programs. So this was, a, they, were, they were moving around. They were not only uh, bringing in lots of books and magazines and the board votes on every, almost everything. There's a book committee. I'm not suggesting you do this. There's a book committee that advises the library. And then after a couple of years, they, they, the board says, well, you know, we can probably let Eva Dickey choose the books for the library. So if the book committee doesn't meet that month, she can still go ahead and buy things. And I thought, yes, good, good for you, Eva. Um, you're moving ahead, getting some authority of yourself. Um, in the spring of 1926, they hire an architect. So West Lafayette is like thinking of expansion very, very early. 1926, they hire an architect and they build that one story addition in the back if you go in if you go there now you can see there's a one story addition um and they talk about um how they were going to construct it. it had to be a brick and blah 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 um and by 1927 the upstairs was brought into regular service for library meetings for children's story hours and for sunday morning meetings by the uh M.E. Men's Bible Study Group, which later changes into the Women's Bible Study Group. Don't know what happened to the Men's Study Group, um, but it, it, it evolves into the Women's um, Study Group. So they are indeed using the upstairs of the library, which is a great, um, which is a great thing, I think. Um, our next picture, do you know where this is? This is the top of State Street Hill. This is very, yes, this is very early, circa 1900. Um, this is before the uh, Louis Sullivan Bank building. But the library board is very early in the 1920s is talking about um, buying property or working with the city to buy property um, in this general area and maybe making a lovely park out of it or making some kind of uh, library park um, kind of idea. So way back in the 1920s, they were already thinking um, not only of expanding the building, but of uh, or bu building a purpose-driven building, but also working with the city to make that happen. Um, the kids get their their own library on the second floor by 1930, and by 1940, this is kind of this is circa 1940. Um, we too have a sign that says public library. Um, and here it is. You may remember this this old Italianate building over here um, that was taken down um, in the in the 1980s. But this is the this is the library as it developed. It had it did have um, some nice window space. It had doors. It no longer had the the room for the horses, which I'm sure everybody or at least many people were happy about. Certainly the librarians were happy about. Um, there was wider interest in community use too, and um, Matt. Um, touched on this with um, with TCPL. Um, in November of 1926, the library board um, approved allowing patrons to borrow books from the Indiana State Library as long as they paid the postage. So even then, the board was concerned about money, as they should have been. 
And they agreed to allow folks from the battleground and Klondike areas to come in and use the library at the charge of $1 per year. You could get a reciprocal borrowing card, the West Lafayette Library for a dollar a year. Um, and of course that is still happening today. We have reciprocal um, borrowing agreements with just about everybody in the state, I think. Um, thanks and thanks to the State Library for coordinating that. Mrs. Dickey guides the West Lafayette Public Library through the 1920s, the Great Depression years of the 1930s. And again, we know it's the Great Depression because at one point the library board votes to reduce. Don't keep this in your minds for too long to reduce the tax levy by a penny. They don't say why it happens in the 30s. So I'm guessing um, it's because of the Great Depression. They reduce it from five cents to four cents. <laughs> so saving the taxpayers um, in West Lafayette a little bit of money and making it more difficult for the library to uh, to operate. It's it's weird that in and I, I know the librarians in here know this that in in depressed or recessionary times, libraries get even more use than they than, than we get in in regular good years. And so it's always ironic that there's this campaign to reduce costs in your public library at the very time when lots of people are trying to use the library because that's one of the few uh, free places still available to them. Anyway, Mrs. Dickey leads the library, also growing the library's collections, book circulation, offering library service to that new Hills and Dales neighborhood along with uh, Salisbury and Littleton, New Chauncey, all of those all of those places as they're growing up. She retires in 1941 before the war breaks out, which I guess is not too difficult because the war doesn't break out for us, the United States until December. She retires in the summer. And then a couple of very capable women guide the library through World War II, the post-war revival, um, and into the 1950s. And when we get to the 1950s, what? Um, this is uh, the 1940s, and I put this in, and thank you, Jean, for getting this stuff originally. Um, this is Victory Reading Club is Library Summer Project. So they are recognizing the larger world in terms of, of saying, hey, um, we're going to name the Summer Reading Club um, our Victory Reading Club, which is probably not a bad idea. Um, and Miss Al Al Alice Grove, one of those very capable women, um, announces a children's story hour. Um, they had they had interesting they had guests guest story readers from the community. Um, it wasn't always a lot. It usually wasn't, from what I can tell the librarian. It would be a guest. You'd bring in Greg, and and Greg would read to the kids. Interesting thought. Um, whoops, did I turn it off? Yeah. Now it's off. <laughs> Here, I'll help. Uh, yay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you both. So here we are, here we are in the post-war years. Um, here we are in 1940, 1947 in the summer. And I, I, I love this photo um, because those kids are just in whatever is going on, except for this, this child in the back. Everybody seems everybody seems enthralled, and there's always somebody who, of course, is like, oh, I don't want it. Um, and and of course, there's the there's the public library um, with a nice close up that probably was color at one point. I'm guessing um, it wasn't by the time we got to it. The 1950s. Whoa, what's going on here? Um, we have National Book Week, um, and it's it's space travel. Set up in connection with National Book, uh, National Book Week includes six live participants hidden <laughs> under helmets, goggles, and other items. <laughs> and so if you can go back, travel back in time to 1958, this was what was going on in your West Lafayette Public Library in the kids' area. And uh, we don't, oh, we do know the kids. Yeah. So if you want to see who the kids were, um, Thank goodness that Journal and Courier was kind enough to tell us. And then over here, um, we have, as it says, attentive listeners, a small group of children listens carefully. As Mrs. Horace Tyler, a member of the West Lafayette Story Art Club, reads from a book. The children are attending a story hour at the West Lafayette Public Library. It happens from 1.30 to 2 p.m., even though it's a story hour, every Tuesday through July 21. And again, I love that these two are like, oh, yeah, okay, mom made us come. <laughs> 
the rest of them seem, you know, delighted to be there. It's wonderful. Um, okay, here we are in the 50s. We're celebrating 30 years of service. Um, I love this photo. I won't go into why I love this photo, but it just speaks to me. Here's the librarian, right? And here's the library assistant. And the Journal and Courier did a wonderful little photo moment there of the two of them. And here we have um, one of the um, the one of the um, assistants is uh, shelving books for children. And here we have um, a young woman with a scarf. I remember this um, when that was de Rigueur, right? Um, and she's going through some of the uh, some of through some of the new books that are on display. We still have these display things um, when I came, and we were using them into the '80s and '90s and beyond. And they may still be in the basement. I don't know. Um, book fairs. We were famous for our book fairs from the 1950s into the new century. I pulled this one because it's a color photo, and it's nice to throw in a color photo once in a while. Um, sponsored by the Friends of the West Lafayette Public Library. We have um, two of them here this evening um, who were very, yeah, who were very involved in the whole thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that many, many of you um, took part in the book fairs or helped with the book fairs or um, uh, certainly um, came and, and enjoyed the book fair. Um, our Freddie Friday, if anyone remembers Freddie Friday, she was one of the first um, people to put the uh, the book fairs together way back when they were in the parking lot in Morton School was the first place they were evidently in the 1950s. I don't actually remember that. Um, but then it was carried forward with the ladder box, the Ulrichs, the Samads, and, and just many, many other people um, who made the book fairs such an incredible experience for so many people um, in West Lafayette. And one of my favorite things to do, and I don't know if late ever helped with this at the end of the book fair when we had all that stuff that nobody wanted after how many tem how many people had come through we'd box it all up and we would take it down to the um i hope i'm not talk telling tales out of school here we would box it up and truck it down to the uh the paper disposal down on second street it was i mean it, as a librarian it really hurt in in one way on the other hand it was really cool to take a box of books dump them in and watch it get swirled into the paper <laughs> bus. um i just still that that is going to stay with me until my dying day i think that was like uh I, I, it made the, the it was good because Lord knows they had plenty. They they certainly had a lot of people looking at them and browsing through them, and there was no place to put the stuff. As my two colleagues were were saying earlier, there was nowhere we could put it. If we brought them back, we would have just been totally overwhelmed. Um, there would have been books. It would have looked like Vaughn's basement. Um, and God bless Vaughn's basement. But that's what it would have looked like if we had brought them all back. Okay. Um, also, you've never lived until you've helped uh, the West Lafayette Parks and Rec deliver the park, West Lafayette Parks and Rec, and we thank Sonia Marjoram for this forever. Um, she asked the um, Parks and Rec folks to pick up the books and then take them to the schools because we do it at Burtsfield or Cumberland or Happy Hollow, uh, Kingston, and they would put them in the kids' locker room. Um, and so you you would walk into the locker room and the, where there were always boxes of books. It was like, wow, this is this is truly a community event. Okay, the firing of the library's first MLS Master in Library Science librarian, um, Lucille Washburn, happens in the 1950s, and the library moves for leaps forward. Um, I I would love to know. I wish I had asked Lucille when when I had the opportunity. Um, because what happens is that we decide, the library board decides, finally, 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 they've been talking about this since the 1940s, of building a new building. It was just, the original building wasn't purpose-built as a library, obviously. It had its faults. Um, it smelled like horse in the summer. And so they decided, you know, let's finally build a library building. A library board member, um, and I won't look out there because any of you could do this, whether you're a library board member or not, a library board member um, donated um, a plot of land where the uh, where this library was built, and then the library board took it upon themselves to buy the adjacent lots. And so, lo and behold, 
um, they had a nice space to build a new public library. Um, and they hired, who would they have hired? Walter Scholler and Associates to design and build the library um, because he had some time in between building everything at Purdue and, and for all the schools in town. Um, and Lucille um, became the first library director in the new building. Um, I love this photo. I don't know where you found it. I, well, I guess in the scrapbooks, but it's a, it's a wonderful, I remember this building because when I arrived, this was still the library building. I'm sure many of you remember this one just the way just the way it was. I remember those poor um, tulip trees that I always, in fact, here they are very young. Do not plant tulip trees where they have no room for their roots to grow. They were, oh, I, I, as a gardener, it just drove me insane. But there they were, and I couldn't take them down because the city thought they were, you know, it's the state tree, you can't touch it. Okay. Um, <laughs> there it is. Isn't that beautiful? Does it, does, how many people remember this? You do? Excellent. Okay. All right, um, so here's Lucille um, greeting a couple of folks and here's a, a, a gentleman. Um, this is the library when it, fir it first opened and I know that because as my two colleagues pointed out, it's very clean, it's spare, there's space, there's tons of light. This is not all you know, <laughs> crowded in. Um, you can actually see space here. Um, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful view of what the library could have been, was it at one time. Um, and it's, it just speaks, and it, it does talk about the library in the early 1960s, clear open lines, airy, airy, airy interiors, a main desk situated as the hub of library service. And I wanna mention a couple of things here um, briefly that um, my, my predecessor, um, Lucia Washburn did. Um, while she was was librarian, also established a school branch um, to serve young readers at the new Burtsfield School, now Willis, um, introduced, and I didn't realize this until I gave some thought of it, she introduced the first real audiovisual program. I mean, they had the slide projector, which is cool, and they used it for children's programs, as far as I can tell, but under Lucille, we bought records, and oh my gosh, they were buying Jefferson Airplane, and they were bought uh, they were buying all kinds of weird, wacky music. Um, they were getting headphones for the kids to use. Um, they were having um, wonderful programs for, for young people. Um, this was all happening in, in many ways. For those of you who know the term library of things, this was be the beginning of the library of things at the West Lafayette Public Library. Um, and I still remember um, the, the LP records. If you were working in a library or anywhere um, around the library, you remember that records were both very popular and also a real bane. They had to clean the stupid things every time. And people were not, uh, were not always very nice with their records when they brought them back. But of course, we'd, we'd clean them up anyway. Um, she developed a truly rich collection of fiction and nonfiction for all ages. Um, that impressed me as when I when I um, when I came uh, and interviewed for the job, I was blown away by the collection. Um, and she also had a focus on local and Indiana authors. And by golly, if you wanted Kurt Vonnegut, it was not under Vonnegut on the fiction shelves. It was in the fiction. It was in the Indiana collection, which drove me crazy. And it didn't take me long before I distribute it back because people would come in and say, don't you have any Kurt Vonnegut? And I would say, well, yeah, we actually do. And we have Rex Stout and we have all those people, but you're, they're over here by the Indiana collection. Anyway, um, Lucille starts a long lasting reciprocal borrowing program. Um, she was part of that um, county um, d a demonstration project with the, uh, with the, um, with the bookmobile. And for some reason we didn't, latch on to it after I don't understand why um, but but neither did uh, Montgomery County but she did certainly um, hold hold on to and expand the reciprocal borrowing program and by the by her time she retired in 1981 the library had grown into the library we know today a hub for reading programming children's programs all around all around the place and an ever-increasing checkouts um, in all kinds of materials and here you can see I love Suffragette topic of library talk in 1975. Not made for walking. This was a shoe display on this at the library. And of course, we were supporting local authors 
um, two of the two gentlemen there um, speaking to each other and, and one would hope to a large crowd um, because we were talking about the books that they had just published. And there's Lucille um, on one of her last days, um, um, the calling uh, the job always meant always learning, um, which is is so very true. What a what a great librarian she was, a great asset to the community and to uh, the world of librarianship. Then this new fellow comes along. He's 27 when he arrives. Um, he of course thought he knew everything because he was 27. So he walks into the library and one of the first things he did was weed the cookbook collection, um, which badly needed it and actually increased the circulation um, of the cookbooks that were remaining. Um, in the next few years, we're going to do a whole bunch of, of changes to the library, give, taking what Lucille gave us and making it um, even better. So in cooperation with, with the library board, um, we took uh, a very generous donation from Bertha Moffat, um, who left uh, much of her estate to the library and using that money as seed money, um, the board, after many, many months of tussling and arguing, um, decided they, well, maybe we could have a small bond issue. And so they they have a bond issue. They use the, the Moffat money and we build this beautiful, really nice addition over here. This is the Moffat um, meeting room space over here, a brand new entrance. And then in the back that you can't see, we basically doubled the size by going in the back. We ate up our parking lot which meant that we had to take down, um, and Greg and a couple of other people never let me forget it, we took down that historic church um, to build a parking lot. And you can, if you're old enough to remember the 70s, you can, you yeah. can sing the song right about now. Um, but it doubled the size of the library, increased our circulation, increased the number of items available, um, and also um, increase the number of people through the doors. And we have these, these incredible um, red blinds that I still, I can still remember those. And Bill Friday, God bless his soul, um, put his pink flamingos in his office. So you could see the pink flamingos um, at the West Lafayette Public Library. Just, just something a little different. Um, there's Nancy Hartman. How, how many remember Nancy? I certainly do. Um, Nancy, Hart Nancy Hartman. Um, is there because I wanted to point out that uh, the computer revolution comes to the library in the 1980s and the 1990s, thanks to a, a gift from Marjorie Zumstein um, from her estate, um, the library starts big time into computerization and we end up with um, my Evergreen is now our third, I think, um, computerized uh, circulation. And of course we have a lot, we have internet and all of that sort of thing. Um, as well. The 2000s begin with change and growth. I realize you probably can't read this, but this is construction heating up the side of the West Lafayette Public Library. We took down that wonderful building from 1962 and built a brand spanking new library, which is, based, is still there, right? That's the 0304 library. I put these in because you can see um, Morton right across the street, which is now the Morton Community Center. Here's the dental office where some of us worked for a year and a half as we were building the, the literally the old library came down completely. The staff got dispersed to the, um, to the building, to the dental folks over here, to the old White House um, over here that the library board bought as part of the expansion project. Um, and here is that community, um, <laughs> beloved community institution of Pete's uh, <laughs> that I know so many of you um, were so, uh, so distraught when the library board bought it and took it down. Again, we wanna thank the Sonia Martram administration for helping us um, with that negotiation. That negotiation was horrible. Um, but we did eventually buy Pete's and we moved the library into Pete's. Um, we used the old bar, um, refurbished it, um, used it for what, nine or 10 months, I think, as the adult collection, adult and teen part of the library. Um, it didn't look or smell anything like the old Pete's. And uh, Lucille had her horse manure. I had stale beer. Yeah, it, it was, but uh, it's amazing what modern day cleaning can do because it didn't, and, and uh, uh, a tip of the hat 
to uh, to our friends across the street because the coffee shop would bring over coffee every morning for us and for the patrons. It would always go by like one o'clock. If you didn't get there by one o'clock, it was all gone. Um, but if you came in early, you got, you got some coffee um, along with using the library. And the kids moved um, into Morton School, or and not Morton School, into the Morton Community Center. Took over that bottom wing over here and made it into the children's room. And eventually, the whole library ended up in Morton for three or four months while we were putting the final touches on the library. So there it is, the new library in 2004. Yay! Um, gorgeous. It's now two stories, um, more than double in size. It went from 17, 18,000 square feet to well over 40,000 square feet. Um, this has taken a couple of years after um, the library was built. I do want to point out these um, um, terracotta tiles on the outside of the uh, of the 04 library. Those are an homage to the Louis Sullivan Bank, and they are also an homage to the city of West Lafayette because each of those leaves is named after a street, city street in West Lafayette. Ever, evergreen, um, oak, maple, um, those are on the um, on the exterior of the library. And we thought that was a cool thing. There's also a Buckeye um, leaf on there, which we hope confuses people far in the future. The Buckeye is there because the library director was from, it grew up in Ohio. Yeah. And, and the library board said, well, we got to put a Buckeye leaf on there. So one of them are Buckeye. Um, yes, an homage to the Louis Sullivan Bank um, which, of course, is still standing, and also to, uh, it's not the Christian Sons, by the way, I need to correct that, to the uh, Christians Frank Lloyd Wright House, Samara. And if you look at the library, um, um, either in this photo or especially if you go in the library, you can see, at, it, not unlike the 1962 library, full of light, full of bringing the outside into the library, making you feel like you're part of the, the larger, um, larger community in which the library sits. Um, library becomes a, a, a home for lots and lots of different public art um, that was outside in the uh, in the amphitheater area. Um, art on the inside of the library that was done by uh, by a former Audubon Public Library director. Actually, um, those are community quilts that Anastasia Kratulis sewed together from, and the and the quilt pieces are from folks in in the West Lafayette or general. Lafayette community, and of course, they're all tree leaves because we were big on tree leaves at that time. Um, it was a neat theme to use. The new plaza allows us to have many more programs. Here we are on Record Store Day, um, very popular event. Um, we had one a couple of years ago, right? Because you were in charge of that. Um, this was a very popular space. Um, we were loath to give it up, but it was the obvious place to, um, to develop the, the new library. Um, we also, of course, built that beautiful um, three-story um, public uh, parking, or at least library parking experience, and the, the uh, I hope the first of many um, murals, public murals, was put on just recently. Um, the library, as as with Otterbin and TCPL, we are charging ahead in the future. Um, books are still very important, um, but so is uh, Libby and Overdrive and all kinds of electronic um, opportunities, and now increasingly the Library of Things, where you can come in and check out all kinds of exciting stuff and either use it in the library or take it home. And of course, Evergreen, Indiana, which is now 130 plus public libraries across the state of Indiana, one card for them all. It's not quite the one ring yet, but one card, um, and you can use Otterbin, and you can use us, and you can use Fowler, and you can use um, um, Plainfield and lots of other places. Um, in 19, 2018, the library board, God bless them, said, you know, looks like we need to uh, build a little bit more onto our building. We, we're running out of space um, where people are clamoring for more things. We held a public survey, and lo and behold, in 2002, um, we had the, the Fancy Dancy um, new expansion with the ribbon cutting, which is exciting, and make sure you get lots of photos. Um, and you can see the library director there, and of course, more importantly, the mayor and Sheila Klinker and um, library board members. And I know we have, we know, I know we have you in there. I don't know if you're in this one, but we have lots of photos of, of John. Um, 
I grew up in Cincinnati. I grew up on the left side of Cincinnati, which is the traditional working, yeah. Um, if it still fits, you wear it. Um, and of course, the, the crowd out here in the, um, in the, and I'm sure you recognize some of these folks. Um, it, was a, it was a beautiful day. And of course, since then, we now have two um, entrances. We have the old traditional entrance, which is still the most impressive to me, and this fun new entrance on Northwestern. So no matter where you're, where you're coming in, do we, do we know which one is, is one more popular than the other? Um, one of our, yes, Scott Tracy and I had a, a big discussion about that. Um, this is upside down. What am I doing? <laughs> that is upside down for some reason, and I don't know why. So we'll just skip to that. That's just like, ah, oh. you give, give the man a slide. Um, many more, but we actually built more room for shelving. And I know there was some concern from people that, oh, I'm sure you're not going to put in more books in the new library because that's not a thing anymore. But we did indeed build more room for shelving. Um, and, and it seems to be uh, still a popular part of the library. It's certainly not the only popular part of the library. But shelf books and shelving seem to still be popular. Here's the new kids area um, with some of our friendly um, children's staff right there in the front. And we kept um, what we thought was going to be a short term um, castle in the old in the 2004 building. We thought, oh, that'll be a fun, whimsical thing we can keep for a while. And well, we couldn't get rid of it because everybody loves it. And so we we um, just kind of adapted it to the new space. And again, it's it's just one of those things you should come to the library for. Um, the bookseller has replaced the book fairs, and it's now open three days a week plus occasional Super Saturday sales um, down in the lower level, as I like to refer to it. Um, some people would say the basement. I like to say lower level because I'm shop at Macy's occasionally. Um, the new local history and archives area, um, this really nifty new space um, on the second floor, which looks out um, on Northwestern, so it looks out onto the city. Um, we're using these um, display cases finally for something useful. And this is the archives area before Devin got a hold of it. Um, and it looks so much better now. And I, I really should put in a new slide, but this is so such a great example of what a an accumulated thing it was. Um, it looks kind of like the basement at at uh, Argenbright or or here, yeah. So history things tend to be, yeah. It's a it's much better sorted out now. Um, but it is it's a brand new part of the West Lafayette Public Library. Um, and we are taking our local West Lafayette history very seriously now. Um, and then some things don't change. Here you see that beautiful sunroom space um, on the second floor of the library. Um, more than one mayor has told me, I wish I had that space in my building. And I, I just very politely nod like you're doing. Um, yes, I'm sure you do. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful space. It is, it is my favorite space in the, in the building. Um, and before they built um, this apartment complex, you actually could see um, well over into Lafayette. You can still see the courthouse many days by look by standing in here. Um, the new plaza, which is something I I I had I had dreamed about this from oh probably the 80s on, and finally um, Mayor Dennis said, you know maybe we should build a plaza out there between the two buildings, um, and I was overjoyed. Um, it really is a fantastic way of tying the two um, civic buildings in down to in, in the new, the old and now new again, um, West Lafayette City Hall and uh, and the the uh, public library. So that's exciting. And there he is um, as he's retiring. He's gotten a little changed a little bit from that from the young woman. Um, I wish I'd not gotten rid of that jacket. I'm sure other guys can can relate. I love it's a green jacket from the 1970s, and I don't know what happened to it. It yeah, I love that. Anyway, um, Nick Shankle, Lucille Washburn, Eva Dickey, um, and now yeah. Mara Honeywell, um, who came in and is now the super new director 
of the West Lafayette Library. This is a great photo from TV 18. So, um, <laughs> works well. Um, and I had to mention um, the Grandview Cottage, which is now open. Um, I will be there tomorrow because it's Thursday, and Thursday is my day. Um, and it is open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's a new um, attempt, new effort to uh, tell the story of West Lafayette um, in cooperation with the city, the Library Foundation, and of course, um, the West Lafayette Public Library, which is um, working with all of us to make that happen. So there it is, the new, brand new, facing Northwestern Avenue um, library building. Um, very well used. Good to know that it's about 50-50. That's, that's cool. Um, so you can enter here. You can enter here. Um, all kinds of ways to get to the library. And hopefully I will see you there. Thank you all for visiting. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Does anyone have any questions for any of our presenters? I have an answer. Okay. Cool. Um, the Carnegie Libraries uh, were rejected by a lot of communities because he was a brutal strike breaker yeah. and uh, hated unions. Mm -hmm. And in towns where there were strong unions and mining communities, factory towns, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. That makes a whole lot of sense. almost a year. What is one of the things you find yourself thinking back on, happy wise memories of your time at the West Lafayette Public Library? Hmm. That's a that's a good that's a good question. Um to, we gotta wait another year. Well, no, I I really I really enjoyed uh, I really enjoyed um answering people's questions, um, working with, with the staff and the library board because they were always true. I, I'm not just saying this because some of them are sitting here. Um, they, tr they truly were great people to work with. It was, it, was, it, was, um, it was one of my favorite parts. That and something Lucille told me um, when she was librarian, um, she said, whenever the books arrived, um, it was like Christmas for her. And I always thought, you know, that's true. You get those big books from Baker and Taylor usually or from Ingr Ingram and you open them up and you go, wow, this is because they're brand new. They don't even have plastic covers sometimes. Um, they're just brand new in the box. And it's like, oh, this is really exciting. You know, that that's probably I miss I miss all of that. I do not miss. Um, I do not miss. And I'll look at Mara when I said I do not miss um, working on the well actually I do kind of miss working on the budget because I used it as a planning document but I didn't miss agonizing over the budget every year um, which and anyone who has worked with a budget I think can relate um, doesn't matter if you're public private whatever trying to make that thing work I don't miss that um, what 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 do you, you two are not retired but what what do you enjoy most about working in the library think of it when I'm not at the library, because that's the distinguishing mm -hmm. factor. <laughs> I do think back to all of the wonderful people I got to spend a lot of time with during the Otterbin 150 projects, yeah. because it was one, people with a common interest in history, two, people who were proud of their community and their community's history, mm -hmm. and three, it was kind of like getting 40 new grandparents who all wanted to be my best friend. <laughs> and I just loved hanging out with them because they were retired and obviously enjoying life enough that they would be willing to share that time with the library. Yeah. So it's a community. Uh, I would say for me, it's working with like, a lot of like local histories, a lot of local history people, especially now with the Bicentennial book. I've been helping a lot of authors with that. Yeah. 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 It's good for fun working with them. Yeah. No, it's interesting that all the library people said to, to me, that's interesting that it's the, it's the people um, even more than the, the, the collections are fantastic. And it's, and it's, that's why we're there really is to help people find information wherever, wherever, whether it's on Google or whether it's on, um, or whether it's in books. Um, but it's the people that, you know, that you get to work with. I spent some hours there after the library was closed, working on research stuff, et cetera, and getting together that collection. 
but you only get to see the people during the open up. That's, that's true. And let's clear that up for people who may not work in libraries. Librarians do not have time to read on the job. At least no. I never did. No. Um, I, I wish that I did. All those WBABA book reviews that I've done since the middle 80s, that's all outside of library time. Um, I would I would do my final read through in the library. But basically, yeah, you don't have time because by golly, people are actually asking you questions and stuff. Um, <laughs> or you're plunging the toilet or there are any number of exciting duties that you have as a library director or a librarian. Here's that word you said, I really like that word. It was a word I'd never heard of before, and I'm not sure what it really meant. It might have meant undesirables, like scrotes, undesirable people. <laughs> Robbery. Robbery. Yeah. A place yeah. to enjoy grog. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, well, thank you everyone so much for joining us. Can we give it another round? Our next uh, program in the series is our Cake Street Store on the 24th. Thank you. Cool.